Hello, I'm Linda C. McCabe, author of Quest of the Warrior Maiden and Fate of the Saracen Knight. My source material are the epic poems Orlando Inamorato by Matteo Maria Bayardo and Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. In this video, I'm going to give my opinions on the various English language translations of Ariosto's poems. And let me share my screen. First off, I want to explain how I came to read Orlando Furioso back in 2003. At that time, I was involved with the Harry Potter online fandom and engaged in theorizing with other fans where we thought the unfinished series was going. There was a theory regarding hippogriffs as potentially being a symbol of love and that there might be some significance with Harry and Hermione being alone on the back of a hippogriff. During my research, I learned that the first time a hippogriff was used as a character in literature was in Ariosto's masterpiece. So I wanted to read the poem in its entirety to see how the hippogriff is used in context. My first attempt at reading Orlando Furioso was using the online version from Project Gutenberg. It was free, so I couldn't argue with the price. I had difficulty following it when I tried reading it on my computer screen. So I printed portions out, hoping to see text on the page would make things easier. It didn't. I was confused, perplexed, and lost. But before I gave up all hope, I discovered the translation by Barbara Reynolds. Of ladies, cavaliers, of love and war, of courtesies and brave deeds I sing. In times of high endeavor, when the Moor had crossed the sea from Africa to bring great harm to France, when Agramont swore in wrath, being now the youthful Moorish king, to avenge Troyona, who is lately slain upon the Roman Emperor Charlemagne. Those opening words in her translations set forth an expectation of a grand, encompassing war, romance, and heroic acts. It was like a light had been turned on in a darkened room. All of a sudden, I was able to read, understand, and enjoy the story. By the third canto, I found myself astounded that this classic tale had Bradamante, a warrior maiden, and niece Charlemagne receiving the call to adventure to rescue her beloved being held in a, as a prisoner in a high tower by a wizard. This was the inverse of what I had come to expect from tales of knights and princesses. It was always the fair young royal maiden being held captive and a brave knight who risked his life to rescue her. Instead, here was a fearless young woman being sent to rescue a knight, and she was also instructed to take the lives of specific people who might stand in her way of marrying her beloved. I started thinking about Joseph Campbell's thesis about the hero with a thousand faces and how the hero raised in obscurity was given the call to adventure, generally by a mentor slash wizard. Ariosto instead gave a young maiden who was a respected warrior the call to adventure in a cave by the enchantress Melissa. She was being asked to rescue her beloved from an enchanted castle, convince him to convert to Christianity from Islam, and then marry her so that she would bear a son who would lead to an entire line of future heroes. In feminist iconographic terms, a crone was telling a maiden to become a mother. This was being done in a cave, and caves are recognized as a symbol of the womb. And this was not just any maiden, but a warrior, symbolized by a blade being transformed into a mother, a chalice. The Penguin's classic translation of Orlando Furioso is in two volumes. 
It is unabridged and divides the epic poem into roughly two even parts. Volume one ends with Orlando losing his wits, going furioso, <laughs> and the story picks up after that leaves off in volume two. Together, there are 1,632 pages with lots of lovely white space to make reading easier on the eyes. The only real complaint I have about this version is that there are spoilers contained in the indexes at the beginning of the first volume. I consulted it regularly, and so there were some aspects of the story that did not come as a surprise to me because I knew about it far more prematurely than I would have otherwise wanted to. So I included a list of characters, locations, and story elements in my novels, but I was careful to not include any spoilers that might lessen the enjoyment of my readers. This was due to my own experience with the Penguin Classics version. The first English language translation of this Italian masterpiece was by Sir John Harrington and published in 1591. The tale of how this came about might be apocryphal, but it is entertaining. Sir Harrington is said to have translated a body passage from the poem, Canto 28, about the sexual exploits of Giocondo and Astolfo, and shared this with Queen Elizabeth's ladies in waiting. The queen was not amused. As punishment to her godson for the lewdness displayed, she forbade him from returning to court until he had translated the entire poem. The banishment started in 1583 and lasted for eight years. His version can be found on Google Play Books for free. The pages are scanned and are therefore not subject to be able to have a font increased or even changed. Another detraction is that the text is written in Old English, requiring readers to perform on-the-sly translations, such as changing the letter F to S in words like courtesies to courtesies and papik to speak. I find the exercise of reading Old English to be challenging and it inhibits my ability to become swept away with the storyline as I struggle to recognize the content word by word. Another English translation is the one by William Stuart Rose. This is from 1823 and is available free online from Project Gutenberg. While the text is written in standard English, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I find it stiff, inaccessible, and utterly confusing. It was the first version I tried reading, and I had to reread passages multiple times to understand what was being conveyed. Overall, I found it to be an unpleasant experience. Had I not discovered Barbara Reynolds' translation, it is doubtful I would have ever finished reading the poem. Another critique I have is Rose's prudishness. I remember being amused at this passage by Reynolds about a hermit trying unsuccessfully to rape an unconscious Angelica after drugging her. And as defenseless in his arms she rests, embracing her, he touches her all over, kisses her mouth and both her lovely breasts. The rough and lonely place gives perfect cover but in this joust, his weary jade resists. For all he longs to prove himself a lover, years having undermined his aptitude, the more he strives, the less he can make good. Whatever methods he experiments, his lacy courser simply will not jump. I wondered how Rose treated that passage and decided to check to see how it was written in stiff in formal English, and this is what I found, or did not find. It appears this passage was too bawdy for Rose, so the stanza was untranslated to protect the sensibilities of his sensitive readers. All in all, 
I do not recommend the Rose translation. Guido Waldman has a prose translation first published in 1974 by Oxford University Press. The biggest drawback for me in enjoying his version is the formatting chosen by his publisher. It is not a fault of his translation, but simply an attempt by the publisher to keep the costs down and stay with only one volume. The font is small, the text is condensed, so there is little white space, which makes the book challenging to read. Another drawback for me is that because Waldman chose to translate in prose, it lacks the cadence and lyrical quality of a poem. And if you're trying to cite specific cantos and stanzas, the citations, it would be difficult to use. Waldman's one volume prose edition is only 656 pages. And Reynolds has two volumes and 1,632 pages. My suggestion is if you're interested in the Guido Waldman translation, get the ebook version. At least then you can boost the font to make the reading easier on your eyes. Next, the most recent translation is the first translation by David R. Slavitt, published in 2009. And I bought a copy shortly after it was published. I have several problems about his work. First off, I want to register a complaint about the editorial decisions made by his publisher, Belknap Press. He submitted a complete translation to his publisher, but the volume that ed editors released was abridged in what I consider to be a bizarre manner. At first, there were stanzas that did not appear, and then entire cantos were deleted. A second volume of translation, Lacunae, the missing cantos and stanzas of Ariosto's Orlando Furioso, was published a year later by a different publisher, Outpost 19, and reveals the redacted content from the first volume. For scholars, for devotees of the poem to read Slavitt's translation in its entirety, you would need two books open and go back and forth between each one. I just find that to be insane. The ebook version by Belknap Press is also identical to the print version. I would have hoped that they would have published an unabridged ebook version that would allow the reader just to read from start to finish. Because there is no worry about page count being a factor to determine the physical costs of the item. But that's not what happened. And Outpost 19 didn't do an ebook version of their um, redacted stanzas. It's only in a trade paperback version. So I don't know. The, the idea of trying to cite Slavitt's work, work in an academic paper and having to possibly navigate two different publications is migraine inducing to me. But beyond my misgivings about the editorial decisions about what to include and what to redact, I have fundamental difficulty with Slavitt's translation. In his preface, he references other translations and gives the opinion that Barbara Reynolds' version was not, quote, funny enough or sprightly enough, unquote. Slavitt expressed a desire to make the story livelier than what Reynolds had done. However, I find his work to be problematic because I regarded his attempts to be entertaining as going overboard. I winced at his historical anachronisms and did not get very far before I set his version aside. I will give you two examples where I found myself pulled out of the story by his modernisms. It's from Canto II, stanza pen. Rinaldo raises up Vesperta, which, believe it or not, is the name of his broadsword. Sacropont holds out his shield, a rich construction of bone and steel, but it's cardboard when the sword slices right through it. Son of a bitch! He sits on the ground and asks for misericord. Angelica, seeing what has happened, is not at all pleased. You do remember the plot? 
cardboard. Slavit used the word cardboard so that it would rhyme with broadsword. Cardboard was not around in the ninth century. I felt whipsawed between medieval and modern periods. Slavit also included the modern phrase, son of a bitch, that was definitely not a part of Ariosto's text. Compare to Reynolds' translation. Behold, with sword upraised, Rinaldo run, and all his might against the pagan fling, who looks to safety from his shield of bone. Fine steel well-tempered in its armoring, the blade, Fosberto, suffers it in one resounding blow, making the forest ring like ice. Both steel and bone, the impact cracks. Nevertheless, nerveless, <laughs> the pagan's arms, all feeling lax. Such a difference. This one stanza demonstrates Reynolds' skill in making a scene come alive with sound and substance. Here's a second example of me being pulled out of the story by Slavit. This comes from a scene from where Ruggiero meets Astolfo, who's been turned into a myrtle tree by the sorceress Alcina. So only the first half of an eight-line stanza. Do you think it's easy? No, it's very hard to say nice things to a tree about how its bark is worse than its bite. You can't even send a card unless it has that recycled paper mark. That passage made me stop reading. The mention of cards and recycled paper marks yanked me back to the 21st century. Ninth century correspondence was done on parchment scrolls. I don't feel obligated to share what Barbara Reynolds wrote, but there is no mention of a recycled paper mark. Slavit is awful when it comes to maintaining tonal historical continuity. At that point, I began surveying the volume as a whole and discovered entire cantos devoted to Bradamante and Ruggiero were missing. My favorite storyline in the poem had been minimized by the editors, rendering the volume useless as source material for my writing project. And besides that, his translation was too loosey-goosey for me. I realized I did not need Slavit's version on my bookshelf, and so I gave away my copy to a friend. I have no interest in buying the missing cantos to see how Slavit treated the storyline of Bradamante and Ruggiero. It is likely there would have been more teeth grinding moments for me, similar to the cardboard and recycled paper mark ones. I feel Slavit's version lacks respect for Ariosto's poem. His version is more of an interpretation than it is translation. Frankly, if he wanted to improve on the source material, he should have just gone full out and done an adaptation like I'm doing. It would be a more satisfying endeavor and more intellectually honest. Cut the aspects of the poem that aren't working for you and invent things where you feel the narrative needs improving. There are many extended passages that are present simply to flatter the patrons of the poets, namely the Noble House of Desta in Ferrara, Italy. And those passages do not add to the forward motion of the plot. For example, whenever there is a mention of future generations to come, you can skim until the figurative begats are over. This is first done in Canto 3, when Bradamante is given the call to adventure by Melissa and told of future generations of heroes who would descend from the son born from her marriage to Ruggiero. It goes from stanza 25 until stanza 62, with a litany of individuals in the Desta family line. The theme is done, demonstrated again in Canto 13, where notable females in the line of descendants are listed, including ones who married into the family, such as Eleanor of Aragon and Lucrezia Borgia. Similarly, 
There are tapestries and elaborate fountains that are interpreted with future lineages described. And unless you are interested in the genealogy of the Desta family, those passages can be skimmed without guilt, for they have no bearing on the plot. So, if you enjoyed this presentation, I invite you to discover my novels, Quest of the Worry Maiden and Fate of the Saracen Knight, based on both Orlando Furioso and Orlando Inamorato. They are available in ebook and trade paperback. Signed copies are available from the wonderful independent bookstore, Kazoo Books in Kalamazoo, Michigan. You can find them online at kazoobooks.com. You can also visit my website at www.lindacmccabe.com or at www.questofthewarriormaiden.com and join my mailing list. Thank you. Please feel free to leave comments as to what you think of the various English language translations and whether or not you agree with my very strong opinions. Ciao.